What can we do to maybe improve quality and size distribution and get the most out of those zones? Whereas maybe some of these lower, better parts of the field, the darker green areas, how do we get the most out of those parts of the fields? And that may be looking at putting in, uh, tightening up the spacing because they've got more battery to, to do better, right? So they can carry more crop. So as part of this project, um, we, we swap back a bunch of fields. Evan sort of put them into three zones, even though the swap map has 10, but they sort of put it into three zones. And then we did grower standard practice spacing versus sort of this, whether, you know, again, the higher zones, the tighter spacing, or the wider spacing, the better zones, the, you know, the, the tighter spacing, trying to understand uh, what, what value that, that might have. There was some work done out of uh, Europe <coughs> in potatoes that did show that there was some value to this, uh, you know, maybe between $100 and $300 an acre uh, in terms of uh, improved uh, profitability from doing a, a, a variable rate seeding strategy. So uh, Evan also, as part of his project, he went and did drone flights on these fields. Like after he did the variable rate planting or the different planting uh, um, regimens, planting seed spacings, he sort of he measured that with drones, and so the drone was able to say what the center of every plant was, and then measure between them, which is really useful for doing. To be how accurate is you know what our target is, how how close is that related to reality? And you can see like this was in the first year, the top top one and the bottom one, you know, the measured is not that far off of what the target was. You know, it's within you know a couple of percent. You know, for the most part, like pretty close. We had one field with really tight spacing where actually what our target was and what the measured was was quite a bit of daylight between them. So it's important to, to understand that and measure that. Uh, in the next couple of years, I think we were able to get a little truer. The measured spacing was a little truer to the target. But we also didn't go with so many tight spacing varieties. This was like, you know, throw it in a practice for this, 23 centimeters is pretty tight, right? So we were trying to, trying to work on that a little bit. Basically, what we did see, for, especially in the first two years of the project, is um, the amount of smalls is always higher in those, I would call them low productivity zones. Um, and it's statistically notably small, higher number of smalls. Whereas the amount of 10 outs is always statistically notably higher in the, in the better areas. So again, it leads credence to, okay, if we can, in those poorer areas, if we can space the plants out a little bit, hopefully have fewer smalls, more, more potatoes that make it to marketable size. And then in the, in the really good areas, we have more ability uh, to maybe put a few more potato plants in to get more total yield at, while still maintaining the quality uh, at structure that we want. So this is comparing those upper zones or those low productivity zones with wider spacing versus the grower standard practice. And you can see it's a little bit of a mixed bag, but the average is about $90 uh, uh, an acre improvement in uh, marketable yield and, and payout. Um, you can see there, yeah, there's definitely some variation here. I will note 21, 22, and 23 in general were three of our wetter growing seasons. So we may not even see the full benefit that you'd see in a drier year with spacing out the potatoes on those drier areas. Um, but even so, an average of somewhere around $90, a, or $90 an acre is you know, nothing to sneeze at. But where we really saw the benefit was on these um, better areas, higher moisture areas. Um, so higher moisture but still well drained. And seven out of 10 times, they did better than the grower standard. And actually there's only one that's really noticeably different than zero. And I'll note that this one here, this Burbank field this past year, that was a seed field that got planted late. Um, so there was a few underlying issues with that field besides uh, that may, may have thrown that off a little bit. But, you know, we could have up to $950 an acre improvement in yield by planting tighter in the better areas of the field. So the average was $357. And that's pretty, you know, for the, if you're comparing just, just in those zones, grower standard versus um, uh, the tighter spacing, the only difference is a bit more seed. Uh, and the amount of seed wouldn't be. Oh, go ahead. Is the fertilizer being buried there too? I'm going to get to that in a second. Okay. 
we <coughs> the first two years of the trial, all we varied was the was the uh, spacing. This year, we also varied spacing and spacing plus varied fertility. Um, I was going to slide on that in a second. So, if we were looking, Evan was putting it in context. So, you don't variable rate the whole field, right? Because there's a certain amount of field that's average that would be basically not changed from what you'd be doing. You have a prescription map. 50% of the field might not change. It might just be the top and the bottom that change. So he was saying, like, if, if only 40% of your field was actually at a variable rate, then that's worth, you know, from his study, that's worth about $90 an acre. But as that, of course, as that increases, then the per value proposition goes up, right? So, you know, up to 60% of your acres, so if, you know, 40% of your acres were at, v, you know, were average and 30 on each side were done at either tighter or wider. You'd use the same amount of seed, but your your value per acre is going up $134. Could you say that the bigger fields would have more variability or not necessarily? Eh, probably, but some small fields still have a surprising amount of variability in them. Um, a small field that's relatively flat, well, it we wouldn't have as much uh, variability, but, you know, it can be down to soil type and a bunch of things as well. We mostly did this on like 20 to 40 acre fields, something like that, were most of what we did on this, you know, there wasn't much more than a 40 acre field in this trial. And there was a substantial amount of rock, uh, variability in some of those fields. Uh, what do you need for, for doing this? Um, you need a planner capable of being <coughs> planning. There's a lot of planners out there right now that have this capability that aren't being used. So if your planner's got hydraulic drive on it, it either may already have the ability to do it and you just need to get sort of the software unlocked and you may need a monitor or something for it. But some of them can also be um, retrofitted or have an addition put on to them to be able to do this. So there's quite a few planners in PEI that can be able to do this. Um, and then, of course, then you need a map to generate the prescription file, so you could use a SWOT map, you could use uh, like historical <coughs> maps, you could use a combination of those things, uh, you could use a soil map, there's, there's a few different, you know, depending on what you've got available and what you're, say you're working with an agronomist and what, often you may be putting two or three data sources together, maybe, you know, yield data from your combine, you know, that sort of thing. But that can kind of help identify those high and low productivity zones in the field. And then you need access to the software uh, or an agronomist with that software to generate the shape file that you put into the system. Um, Evan's been doing this for a few growers down the last few years, and he's got a company that, that can do some of that, but there's some other people that can do that for you as well. It's basically the same as making a VR fertilizer wrap. It's just instead of a, you know, uh, a potash target, you know, you're putting in a, a seed spacing target, right? So it's it's not that wildly different. Um, a couple of just little helpful hints from Evan. There was about a thousand acres or more of uh, VR planted potatoes last year <coughs> in PEI, and I know multiple other growers that are gearing up this winter to do it for next year. Um, if you've got a field, especially a regular shaped field that fields with grass waterways or you know different types of edges and stuff, um, if your edge if the edge of the computer reads or that your map reads is not the actual edge of the field and you're going out over that, uh, over that boundary, your planter could just shut off. So you need to set like a default rate for the whole field. And then every, so that, you know, it comes to the end of the row and it isn't shutting off, but it's still going to put in, you know, 12 inches, let's say, and, and as the default. Um, that was one of the sort of little helpful hits from this year. Um, Evans also, some of these fields, some of the growers we work with have yield monitors, so we're looking to sort of tie together some of that yield monitor data with these maps as well, to sort of analyze it in a second way other than just with the strips that we did before. Um, that's sort of in progress. Evans just finishing up his, his uh, um, write-ups in his project here right now. So, um, so in summary, uh, over three years, we generally saw that the upper landscape zones, the wider distribution mostly led to increased profitability, mostly due to size distribution. So it cut the smalls a bit, increased the 10 ounce a bit. 
there's a slight increase in yield in some fields, but that yield increase is probably smaller than that improvement in size distribution and improvement in marketable yield rather than total yield. But in the stronger areas of the field, the tighter spacing almost always resulted in increased total yield as well as marketable yield. So that's really where a lot of the savings were. Uh, so this past year, in the fields that we did in the project, we did do, so we did grower standard practice, we did VR seeding, and then we did VR seeding plus VR fertility on the infurro in the planter. So if it increased seeding by 15%, it also increased, uh, uh, or we, Tightened it by 15%, we also increased 15% uh, fertilizer. Um, what we found was basically no response. There was no positive response to putting in more or less fertilizer in those zones. And actually, I helped Evan dig a couple of these trials, and where we had the more fertilizer with the tighter spacing, it actually decreased yield. And I think that was probably too much nitrogen in a couple of those cases, like kept it immature a little bit longer, so we had a little more smalls and little, not as good a set. So I know a lot of you already do VR potash or you may be pre-applying some nitrogen ahead of time. So that's probably, you know, you may already be doing that VR. Um, so you can choose whether or not you want to do that uh, with the planter or not. But we really didn't see much value in doing the VR fertilizer with the planter. So I think for simplicity's sake, you could keep it just on the VR planting for now. And we didn't really see, we didn't see any negative impact to that. So Evans presented this a couple of times, probably many of you have probably seen some of this before, maybe not this update, um, but there'll be a full report on it available through our agronomy site probably a little later this spring. Does anybody else have any questions in terms of what we did on variable rate planning? I do think it has some real potential um, for growers here without really like, other than getting your planter set up, the actual public cost of doing that are not very high. Uh, and I think you could probably make your money back on that setup in one year um, from what we've seen in the trial so far. So. Any comments, questions? How do you know what to change your spacing by based on increased or decreased fertility? Yeah, we, we kind of went with 15%. Um, but it depended a little bit on like how tight the spacing was in the first place. So if you're doing rush of Burbanks that are already you're planting at 14 or 15 inches, you're, you know, 15% you, is a wider swing. Whereas if you're planting something that you normally plant at 10 inches, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit different. What we did at, at 12 inches, like if a standard was 12 inches, they were moving it by an inch and a half either way. And that may end up being a little bit of trial and error too, right? For some people, by variety, by feel, that sort of thing. Um, but I think, you know, and if you say, look, I'm doing really well. If I'm normally at 12 and at 10 and a half, it did really well, maybe that means I need to increase my GC <coughs> down to 11 and then my, I change my numbers again. It's kind of iterative process, a little bit of learning. Right now, I'm not, you know, we just said, let's pick 15% either side and see what it does. That's kind of how, how we worked on it. Any other questions? Okay, I have one more uh, slide deck to show you. We did a, we sponsored a project um, with Evan <coughs> and uh, Steve Watts looking at the uh, Bluefield Seeding uh, Solutions press wheel kit and like, seed sensing technology. And the conceit behind this was we were looking at what is, what's the effect agronomically, but also what's the effect looking at greenhouse gas emissions, because that's partly how the project was funded. And also, like, if we can get potatoes seeded faster by using this type of technology, does it enable you to use less fuel and have uh, less greenhouse gas emissions? But also, if you're able to plant two or three days faster, what's that, you know? That's got operational issue or operational advantages to the farm as well. So this is Steve's deck, and Steve spoke for the last couple of days. He's not here today, so I'm not going to go into too much detail on some of these slides. But um, Steve Holland, many of you know, Steve Holland was here a while ago, and his a lot of his main focus was we got to slow the planters down to improve accuracy, to improve emergence, to improve marketable yields. And he was really big on slowing the planters down. A lot of people did slow the planters down. And then realized, geez, it's taking me forever to get these potatoes planted, so then the planters speed back up again. So it's 
what can we do to maintain that accuracy uh, and, and, and get a nice even emergence of potatoes, but, but be able to do it in a more, you know, more timely manner. And that's when we started looking at, Steve and, and Evan looked at, did a little bit of work the last couple of years looking at this technology that Craig McCluskey developed and it's available being sold through Allen. Um, looking at the press wheel technology with the seed sensing technology as part of it to, and basically, can we go faster without compromising yield, without compromising, you know, planter accuracy, that sort of thing? Um, and what impact does that have on profitability? So they did a trial with uh, Jonathan McLennan up west and they put the, put the technology on the planter and uh, basically there's five different varieties or, or different fields here and some are for seed, some are processing, but basically there's a grower standard rate, which on most of them is three miles an hour. There's a like 25% increase, which is about, you know, it, it changes a little bit by variety, but it's it's going up a, up a you know, they, they call it GSP plus, and then there's like a GSP plus plus, which is like the faster speed. So you can see, a couple of them, it's it'll go up to four miles an hour, a couple of them it's going up to five miles an hour. It depends a little bit on the initial spacing and the variety and the <coughs> that sort of stuff. But um, there's basically at different speeds, do we see any difference in, in yield, difference in accuracy? And on the yield side, this is total yield and that's marketable yield. This clear water seed field was planted late and harvested, or killed early and harvested early, so the numbers are a little bit wonky on it. But most of the other ones, the the GSP plus, so the first step up in speed was the best uh, in four out of five of those, and not that definitely not behind the grower standard. The even faster um, was better than the GSP in three at or three out of the five, um, or, or or more or less equal. So there was no disadvantage to going faster. Um, it looks to me like maybe the intermediate speed was the, just a little bit the best, but even so the Compared to the GSP, the marketable uh, is, is either the same or better uh, in each of those cases. So they were able to show that there wasn't a, there's no yield uh, detriment to going faster. Uh, there wasn't a quality difference with going faster. This is the impact of planting speed on, on net crop value. So again, you can see there's more numbers above the bar than below. Um, this is, that was clear waters again that were not so great, but the rest of them, they're either not really much different, so there was a bit of an improvement in net crop value by going faster. And then its impact on CO2 emissions, the one I'd really show you is the one that's average at the end. And while the difference is slight, there is a difference. So both of the fastest planting speeds, um, you are able, yeah, you're using more fuel going faster, but the amount of extra fuel you're using isn't, isn't, uh, is less than the amount of the, the, the fact that you're able to plant more quickly. So you actually, there was a net benefit in terms of CO2 emissions from uh, the fuel usage. So the general conclusions were on the GHG side, they reduced emissions by four to five percent. They were able to increase acres per hour considerably. Um, and with it, without a yield penalty or without a quality penalty. And what does that really mean? Well, if you're planting side by side, like really, there's not really probably that much difference between with this technology in planting, you know, your regular field at three mile an hour versus four or five mile an hour in yield. Like the, the difference you'd see is probably not that much it, on that day. But what it does is that if you're, again, if you're planting 600 acres with one six row planter, and you get to the end of the season and it starts, you know, you're getting into some rainy days and you're getting into days you'd rather have the crop all in the ground. If you're able to plant two or three days faster, finish two or three days faster, those fields at the end of the program, at the end of the planting window, if they're in the ground two or three days earlier or four or five days earlier, they will have more yield because they'll be in the ground more days. So um, you're not going to make more yield on every acre, but you probably make more yield on the, on the fields that are, would normally be planted later. And um, a really good value is, is you know, allowing the oper operator to it. Uh, you know, you can dial in that speed for yourself. So there's an in-crab monitor that shows you your accuracy. 
And if it's getting out of whack, then you can back it off. If it's good, you can creep it up. So you've got that ability to adjust on the fly and really understand what works rather than have to go out and dig up sets and measure and figure out your accuracy and all that donkey work that nobody likes doing. So you can do that kind of as you, on, the, on the fly uh, and it works pretty well. So um, this was a project that was funded under the Climate Challenge Fund. Um, and uh, we, we ran it through the board uh, so that we could share all the results with everybody. There is a full report on this if it's something you want to dig into a little bit more. I was also told that the Department of Agriculture does have some funding under the SCAP program um, to help cover a percentage of cost on this technology if you want to add to the planners. So I'd say talk to Rodrigo at the department um, if you have questions about that and see whether you're about your eligibility and how that might work and that sort of thing. I was told I think they think they might cover up to fifteen thousand dollars for it. So it's something to look into. Does so anybody have any questions on this? I know I rattled through that pretty quick, but any questions? Beyond my knowledge on that. I think I have, I've been hearing mostly positive feedback on it, but I, yeah, that's beyond my ability to know. Any questions?